Dr. Paul Herou is a scientist and professor of toxicology and health effects of electromagnetism on the medical faculty at McGill University in Canada. He has advanced degrees in physics and expertise in both electrical engineering and health sciences. EMF Medical Conference presentation, a chicken in every pot, a fiber in every home. I am the author, Paul Eru, PhD from McGill University, Faculty of Medicine. Now we know very well that uh, we are subjected more and more to increasing levels of electromagnetic radiation, primarily from cellular phone systems. And apparently there is in the works intentions of industry to expose us to even more. And as this slide shows, the average adult spends 3.81 hours per day on mobile already. This is a very significant exposure. Our exposures to this radiation come from two sources essentially. The very short-term exposure from a cell phone that you hold against your head, as well as the exposure that is continuous from an array of mass antennas that are serving all of these mobiles around you. Now, uh, although industry tries to, denies the, to deny this, in fact, these exposures do have, uh, I would say, impacts on your health, they uh, should be controlled and should be uh, looked at very seriously, in particular, uh, as we are on the threshold of a deployment that would increase this radiation. Now, I am showing this slide in great part in homage to uh, Dr. Martin Blank from Columbia University, who passed away, unfortunately, recently. And he, what he was trying to show with this slide is that for a variety of agents like fisheries, radiation, benzene, asbestos, PCBs, halocarbons, diethyl stilbestrols, antimicrobials, and so on and so forth, it takes us an enormous amount of time before the consequences or the Council of Public Health is being taken into consideration. This is uh, something that indicates that we don't really learn as a function of time in terms of abating or avoiding risks that are related to industry or to developing technology. And my role and the role of many others is to help society and the human race avoid these risks if we can. Now, in the past, we have had experience with things that were fairly significant in terms of human morbidity and mortality. Now, this is a slide that shows in 1952 the smog event in London when uh, thousands of people died within a few days as a result of air pollution. And of course, over time, this problem of air pollution has morphed into a problem of climate change that our politicians have not done a very, very good uh, job of tackling. So what I am essentially pointing out is that we cannot necessarily trust them to handle such problems. Uh, another uh, very saddening situation is that of lead. In other words, over uh, decades, we exposed uh, much of the world to levels of lead that were really unnecessary because certain corporations had an interest in promoting specific products. And from their point of view, which is a point of view, it seemed that uh, broadcasting in the environment metals that had known neurological and health consequences was more important than taking precautions or uh, I would say developing proper substitutes. So industry wants to proceed fast. It has investors that it needs to satisfy. And so consequently, public health often takes a, a I would say, uh, the back seat uh, under these conditions. So if you want to look at a comparison between what happened with lead and what is happening now with electromagnetic radiation, as we see at the top, 
Well, the uh, exposure was documented very, very early, and the limits that were shown to be deleterious for lead have been known since Roman times. In other words, we have ancient uh, data that shows how the people who mined lead had all sorts of neurological problems. And we know that uh, industrial man had raised his lead burden a hundred times and level of atmospheric lead a thousand times. As well, right now, the US Federal Communications Commission limits are 10, oh my God, billion times higher than the natural background radiation. This is something to think about. Are we so innocuous to this agent that we can accept increases in exposure of that magnitude? The evidence of toxicity has been there for both. Uh, the Greek physician, uh, Nicander of Colophon in 130 years BC, uh, knew about this. Uh, Lockhart Gibson knew about this. Alice Hamilton was a pioneer in studies on lead poisoning. But uh, in spite of this and in spite efforts to bring to the public's attention the uh, consequences of lead exposure, uh, it was not possible to prevent uh, corporations like General Motors from promoting the, in, the introduction of lead into gasoline. Uh, the effects of electromagnetic radiation on neurotoxicity, on behavior, on the blood-brain barrier, on brain tumors, on acoustic neuronas, on leukemia, on Alzheimer's disease, on breast cancer, on fertility and reproduction, on fetal and neonatal effects, and even autism, are all in the literature, but this massive literature is widely being ignored for other motives. And there were smoking guns. At one point, people had to see that lead was a problem. And this happened around 1973 in the United States. And Apparently, we have at the moment a smoking gun that has just happened over electromagnetic radiation. And those are the National Toxicology Program, the report that was issued in 2019, a, a large experimental study on animals, mice, and rats that was designed to assess whether electromagnetic radiation induced cancer or not. And at, this, at the same time, more or less, the Ramazzini Institute of, in Italy uh, released a corresponding study that uh, assessed the exposure not on of cell phones, but on the cell towers that served them. And their, uh, their assessment was that, yes, both the, uh, the uh, cell phones from the National Toxicology Program and the cell towers from the Ramazzini studies, yes, both of these uh, increase cancer. And we have a number of other studies like that, that of Chu in 92, Ripacholi in 97, and Lurchell in 2015, that, that all point to the same problem of cancer, which is not the only one. How all of this evidence can be kept under the carpet is very surprising. So spinning the evidence is, that the risk for lead were denied by lead sellers because impacts could not be immediately quantified. We just didn't have the means to do it. And at the moment, industry challenges the methodology of the studies or claims that there is bias in the researchers. But the question I have is, how do you convince the 4,288 rats and the 2,180 mice that have displayed tumors in the study to be biased. So uh, in the end, in front of this evidence, very often what happens is that the very basis of science is questioned. It happened uh, in 1979 with Professor Needleman, and he complained that no agent can ever be demonstrated as toxic to industry satisfaction because we can't test these toxicants on humans. So they always claim that these animal studies are invalid. And recently, 
The U.S. Food Administration's uh, Dr. Shuren claims that exposures in the National Toxicology Program were not appropriate, although the study was designed specifically to assess the risk of cellular phones. So essentially, what has happened and what is happening in the United States right now is that information is being suppressed. And at a certain time, the same thing happened with lead in the sense that at a certain moment, it was forbidden in the United States in the 20s and 30s to market your gasoline as being lead free because it would be, it would place the organizations who placed lead in their gasoline at a disadvantage. So this reg regulatory suppression is extremely troubling because it means that industry is able to, I would say, train the politicians who are fairly easy marks simply because they don't have the time usually to review these questions extensively. Train them to support uh, not thought out uh, economic development, even though there are alternatives. So industry would underwrite irrelevant research such as happened in Robert Kehoe's Kettering lab. And in the case of electromagnetic radiation, what, what was done was to focus exclus exclusively on heat as if this was the deleterious agent while everyone knew it wasn't. And there is a problem with the geographical scope of the, of the problem. If you put lead in all gasoline on the earth, it's so widespread that you cannot uh, find the effect very easily. And in the same way with 5G, if we blanket the earth with electromagnetic radiation, how are we going to find out what its effects are since we will all be exposed? The symptoms of lead poisoning it's been called an aping disease because its symptoms are so frequently those of other ailments. EMR intoxication acts on very basic aspects of metabolism and so manifests differently in different people, but early on targets the nervous system. And that's why we have developed a, a population of people who are electromagnetically sensitive. Now the consequences in the case of lead are very well known. 5,000 Americans died annually solely from lead-related heart disease prior to the country's lead phase out. 68 million young children had toxic exposure to gasoline's lead from 27 to 1987, resulting in a permanently reduction in IQ. With electromagnetic radiation, what are we looking at? Increasing cancer risk, we can see them rising. Chronic diseases, particularly neurological, diabetes, hypersensitive populations. And in spite of this evidence, we have to have mountains of bodies around cell towers before we do anything, right? Now, eradication of the problem and alternatives. Lead was replaced by ethanol, which should have happened in 1927, avoiding 60 years of exposure to lead. In other words, it was possible to avoid this exposure. For electromagnetic radiation, optical fiber and li-fi, in other words, using light as opposed to microwave radiation can eradicate 5G and bring reductions in electromagnetic field exposures. So what does 5G mean in practice if it is deployed? Well, it means densification of the antenna network, 40 to 50 base stations per square kilometer close to your home. So you will be surprised when this is planted in front of your window, but this is what is in the works a much richer spectrum to increase speed of data transmission. However, this increases the, I would say, the width and the, uh, the power of the biological impacts that will, be, uh, uh, that will accompany this exposure. We want higher frequencies to decrease latency. It means latency is the time that it takes for a system to respond to a human command. 
Well, with higher frequencies, latency decreases, but with higher frequencies, the radiation concentrates in a smaller fraction of the body, which means increased doses superficially on the skin, on the eye, and so on. There will be large increases in human exposures to electromagnetic radiation uh, because uh, of all sorts of reasons, because 5G is the basis of the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is the land of bots. Bots are automated software that generate traffic on the Internet. And those are automated systems that use the Internet. They're not your use of the Internet. As well, because of 5G, there will be a more granular electromagnetic environment, multiple input, multiple output, and beamforming means a, I would say, a road that is much more, uh, I would say, rocky and irregular than what we had in the previous generations of cellular. And as you can see here in this uh, diagram, a mast for 5G will carry relatively uh, small antennas, and these antennas have a beaming pattern. In 4G, you had a wide, uh, I would say, dispersion of the signal. It was a bit similar to broadcasting. With 5G, you have a concentration in one direction, and this is wanted because it will allow more traffic to be accommodated within a given volume of space. In other words, these patterns of radiation would interfere with each other, whereas these pencil-like uh, beams of radiation, you can accommodate a lot in your environment. So all of this speaks to much more radiation than before. Not everybody likes this, as you see here, because these things are being installed close to your home. In other, word, in other words, 5G is a type of invasion uh, of intrusion into our world by an industry that sees an opportunity because of the popularity of cellular systems to expand its presence. And the whole question is, is this expanded presence appropriate given the uh, hygiene and the health impacts that it has? And if not, are there good alternatives to it? Now, in 5G, we are increasing the data transmission rate essentially because we are increasing the frequency. In other words, with a higher frequency, those are essentially the lower bands that we used to have, the existing cellular bands, and those are the new bands, and essentially they are much wider. So consequently, they can transport a lot more information simply because this bandwidth here is much larger than this bandwidth here. And of course, you have to have the proper signal to noise ratio in order to ensure unintelligible uh, data transmission. The second thing about 5G is that because it works in some cases at much higher frequencies, the air is not as transparent to this radiation. So in other words, you have to yell louder to be heard. And because the wavelength is much smaller, your antenna is smaller. This is the antenna aperture. And so if you have a frequency that is higher, you're gonna have what is called free space path loss. Essentially, you have a, a, uh, uh, a wavelength that is much smaller, so you get fewer volts per meter. Now, the radiation penetration depth is related to the frequency that you're using. The higher the frequency, the less penetrating it is, which means that it concentrates its energy loss in a very small proportion of the body. At, five, at 10 gigahertz, the penetration depth is about 5 millimeters. In other words, this is the depth at which 30% of the energy remains, two-thirds have, has been dissipated between zero and five millimeters. And at 50 gigahertz, it is one millimeter. But note that with ultraviolet light that is known to cause cancer, 
This has a penetration depth of less than 0.1 milliliter, millimeters, but you will still hear people in industry uh, carry the notion that since it doesn't penetrate the body, it can cause no harm. Now, these ideas about beam forming that you see here are not new at all. You have here in 19... 81, the MiG-31 fighter had in its nose right here this kind of structure, which is a bunch of dipole antennas that are meant to detect enemy aircraft. So uh, with, w rather, it's rather surprising that Tom Wheeler would present 5G as wonderful new technology when it is something that, ha that has been known forever. And essentially, how you beam form is by using a group of dipoles that essentially can be phased and change in intensity in such a way as to radiate in a given direction. What are the problems associated with 5G? Well, 5G is in great part a marketing con concept for this industry to obtain spectrum because spectrum is a very limited resource. The more you have, the more you have authorization to use it, the more data you can transport. And if you have a wonderful new technique of 5G, a new generation, you're going to attract private and government investments. Governments can very easily be convinced that this will give them economic supremacy because it's such a great idea. You have uh, support from non-technical and industry pamphlet-informed higher government that is led to believe that 5G will yield economic or military superiority. But 5G is faced with wide popular opposition in countries that are more aware of health impacts of high radiation levels, such as Italy and Switzerland, for example. Italy has had long experience with this because of the increased rates of leukemia around the Radio Vatican uh, towers. So they have been brewing this problem for a very long time. Uh, 5G also has false claims of including underserved communities. 5G is uh, an intention to provide fast data service to densely populated cities where there is the most money to be made. This is natural for industry to do. Also, it has no technical integrity, 5G. It's divided into a variety of frequency bands. Uh, promotion exaggerates performance and deployment. We'll see that later. In other words, they say we're already everywhere and we have, have already great performance and their unjustified ties to critical applications. They claim that it's necessary for self-driving cars and for, for remote surgery. As well, 5G is a threat to privacy because of its tie to Internet of Things. 5G is the basis of Internet of Things. It's also a contributor to global warming, vastly less energy efficient than optical fiber. And it's true, though, that 5G may be needed for special industries, but for the citizen, it has very limited, uh, I would say, usefulness. Spectrum is critical for 5G success. This is an industry slide, and it's true. They want to gain more spectrum. Unfortunately, by gaining more spectrum, they increase human exposures and I know that human exposures are tied to the incidence of disease. So this low band, mid band, and high bands all constitute, if they are all used, increases in human exposure to radiation. And the low band will be used as it is now, essentially, for nationwide communications. In metropolitan areas, it will be used as a mid band frequency and the millimeter waves, which are what 5G likes to portray itself as because it is faster, will only be used in the dense urban areas where there are lots of customers. So essentially, we have this 5G, uh, I would say, uh, trident of 
three groups of applications that are supposed to serve in the cartoon of the industry presented here, various functions. And of course, one important aspect of these things is the internet of things. But as we change the frequency here from the low bands to the mid bands to the high bands, we increase the frequency as you see here from one gigahertz to 48 gigahertz the depth where one third of the energy remains goes down. So the energy of the radiation is distributed in smaller and smaller fractions of the human body. Of course, when you increase the frequency because of the characteristics of the radiation, you have less coverage, which is why you need these thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of antennas to cover a country. This makes no sense in my opinion. In terms of bandwidth, as you increase the frequency, your data capacity rises. And because this, these higher frequencies are so fast, the latency is reduced as you go up. So this will be high capacity, hotspot, dense urban. And this will be more or less like the traditional cellular systems that we have presently. Now, the performance of these 5G systems have been rather disappointing. In other words, as the pressure to prevent the deployment of 5G from individuals, from organizations, and even from states like New Hampshire uh, increased, uh, the, uh, I would say the, uh, the declarations of industry became quite ridiculous in terms of increased service. But what we see in practice is that 5G is just a modest update. It's not the all changing, uh, I would say, technical revolution that they uh, anticipated. And of course, industry likes to uh, paint these, these uh, national pictures of where we are already and we're already deploying 5G it's such a triumph, it's so wonderful, people love it and so on. Well, this is not entirely compatible with reality. They are telling us that you need 5G for self-driving cars. In fact, this is not true. A, a self-driving car will drive more or less the way you do, by looking in front of it with a camera and with a laser. If you want to link it to a network, you may but it is absolutely not necessary to do so. As well, these uh, stories that it's necessary for remote medicine are untrue in the sense that medicine remote or a medicine as surgery is best served by optical fiber, not by wireless links. But industry would like to eliminate essentially all the fixed cables installation and replace them with wireless access. And they have gr uh, grandiose projections for their own market in the future. And essentially this uh, desire of industry to, uh, to expand wireless has to be supported by a backhaul, which is essentially based on optical fiber anyway. In other words, Industry wants to have optical fiber in your street, but it is reluctant to give it to you in your house simply because they won't be able to sell you at, at as high a price a cell phone subscription. So what is happening on the internet? Industry is saying internet traffic is increasing at incredible speeds. We have to satisfy the demand. In yellow here, you have the demand by humans. And over time, more and more is being overtaken, not by humans who want information, but by software called bots. And you have two categories here, bad bots and good bots. Good bots essentially are something very simple. It's advertising. In other words, they want to advertise to you as much as possible using this medium. The bad bots are in fact, uh, I would say programs that are out to perform crime. In other words, impair the publicity of others or steal information. So what you see is a growth of an internet that 
will ultimately minimize the contribution of people, but will maximize a cyber space that is, I would say, configured by commercial ventures that have a good fraction of essentially illegal activities. So if you want to create a country where you have a deployment of a massive deployment of such capacity, uh, I don't know uh, if I agree with you. Uh, it's also been uh, said very frequently that cellular systems increase productivity incredibly. But in fact, cellular systems, if you look at the time when they were first introduced and to the point where they became relatively mature between 3 and 4G, in fact, it seems that the record indicates that they were a damper on productivity. Now, we know essentially that we are overwhelmed by communication right now. Uh, anyone who's had to, uh, to reduce to, uh, to the bottom a stack of emails knows exactly what we're talking about. Communication has become so cheap that we are overwhelmed by it. We have radio, we have television, we have already cell phones. We have all of these means of telecommunications in, on top of written material. And yet we are being proposed another layer that would be apparently more powerful. And what we see is that essentially uh, cell phones have been liberating for individuals. It's extremely convenient and it has probably allowed them to uh, to be distracted from the work that they have to do when it has taken American industry approximately 25 years to learn to compensate for this loss of productivity. Now, are there alternatives? Optical fiber is incredibly faster than 5G will ever be. It is completely private. It has extremely low consumption of energy. So industry has in its pocket and it is already using techniques of data communication that are much superior to 5G. Why aren't they being used? Uh, for optical uh, transmission, you, you have a, an absolutely rock bottom energy requirement of less than one picojoule per bit. Whereas the deployment of 5G would be a threat to global warming. And uh, you should know that in China already, although they have already deployed 5G in many cities, they shut them down for a fraction of the day because the telcos cannot afford the amount of electricity involved. Essentially, as you increase the frequency, the power needed increases either as F or more realistically as F cubed. So in other words, it's extremely expensive to generate a lot of speed with such systems. So the only way to get huge speeds is to go to a medium like optical fiber that is extremely small in terms of its energy consumption. If you want mobility, you can use Li-Fi, which uses the light in your office as a means of communicating with your computer. As far as we know, visible light is not deleterious to humans because we believe that we have evolved in the light from the sun for billions of years, whereas exposure to microwaves is entirely new to human physiology and to, hum to any living physiology for that matter. And we have also used uh, modulated infrared, which is a form of light that is very uh, common in the environment to transport a lot of data. And here you have a uh, very common code that is used around 36 kilohertz to command uh, peripherals in your home. But uh, you can use frequencies that are much higher and Li-Fi, in fact, can be much faster ultimately than 5G can. So, uh, when assessing the risks, the FCC believes that only heat is a factor. 
In fact, what we knew is that we know is that in physiology we have electrons and protons that transfer. We have hydrogen bri bridges that are critical to biological function. And all of these are completely ignored by industry. They say non-ionizing radiation cannot hurt you, but the body is already ionized. So whether the radiation is ionizing or not is irrelevant. It's whether the, the, the fields have an effect on the charges present in the body that is relevant. They claim that the fields are too low to be of consequence, but the FCC limit is enormous. We have uh, reports in biology that have been reported at minuscule levels. And in fact, there are devices that are manufactured that can sense fields that are minuscule. So there is no uh, support for this view. So FCC decisions support the deployment of engineered devices not safety. And we have seen that successive decisions by the engineering bodies that I would say uh, uh, determine standardization have always protected applications ahead of protecting people. The physical scale for risk, measure, for risk measurement is over one grams or 10 grams depending on the institution, while in fact, the sperm cell is, has a size of 30 micro uh, cu cu cubic meters, so micro uh, cubic meters. So essentially, this not only is the variable that is used for assessing risks, heat is irrelevant to biology. The scale at which it is assessed is also uh, improper. The, uh, the time scale for the risk is six to 30 minutes, whereas we know that molecular events are extremely rapid. So all of these uh, factors point to the notion that industry has set the stage to ignore true biological impacts in favor of the life, essentially, of semiconductors, their deployment and multiplication. So we know that in living systems, this is, uh, this is complex one of oxidative phosphorylation which is contained in all mitochondria. And we have here the jumps made by electrons. And these electrons tunnel from one molecule to another to support oxidative phosphorylation. These jumps are tunneling. These jumps can be impacted by the presence of external fields. And we have known since at least 1985 that the radiation from cell phones is able to change oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria and in all cells that have been tested. This is for uh, complex uh, three, and this is essentially relating to the movement and protons of electrons going from one radical to the other uh, inside complexes. All of these things are relating to free charges that exist in biological signals, uh, systems, and all of these phenomena are considered as irrelevant by the FCC, who says that if it doesn't heat, it doesn't do anything. DNA here is stabilized by hydrogen bri bridges, which is essentially the movement of protons between two locations that are equivalent between molecules. Now, if you apply fields, we know that these hydrogen bridges are affected. In my own laboratory, I proved without a doubt that the field levels that are promoted to be inoffensive by the FCC in a number of human cancer cells, the fields that they claim to be inoffensive are all capable of reducing the number of chromosomes in these cells. So if you can reduce the number of chromosomes in cancer cells, what this means is that you are affecting in a serious way the metabolism of these cells. And so why is this not being taken into account? I don't know. I have made other studies based on the effect of uh, electromagnetic fields being able to generate reactive oxygen species and triggering apoptosis and necrosis again in erythroleukemia cells. Well, it turns out that the stress to cells from electromagnetic fields, and I'm talking about fields that you find in your environment, 
this fee, this stress on cells is worse than the stress stress from exposure to reactive oxygen species react uh, generated by oxygen in other, in other words magnetic fields are as or more influential on oxidative phosphorylation than oxygen is so the biggest threat essentially is from the internet of things protocols because the intention of industry is to link everything it can this will lead to a very large increase of your dose of radiation these high bands uh, will be used for certain applications but these lower bands here are the ones that will in the end uh, i would say affect your exposure the most and we already know what these frequencies do because these frequencies are very similar to the ones that are in use in cellular systems we know that they are connected with cancer that in all likelihood they cause cancer we have both epidemiological and we have physiological evidence of this when these pulses of electromagnetic radiation transit from air to tissues the dispersion allows biologically active components of the pulses to penetrate trade deeper in the tissue than the energy itself even if these components carry less energy we have known for a long time that there is a cataract risk associated with non-thermal microwave radiation a scientist an ophthalmologist named Zaret uh, described capsular cataract and suggested a role that is separate than heat for microwave radiations in destroying protein essentially in the lens of the eye but this uh, data was challenged and fought by the industry because they knew that it would impair their capacity to deploy to deploy their systems for telecommunications and for cellular systems but we know that pulse straight microwave radiation is more damaging than continuous microwave radiation and what has happened over time is that from the AM and FM radios that we used to have, the modulation of these signals has been changed arbitrarily and for purely technical reasons in order to support data communications. These changes has, have led to uh, a very big variation in how the impact of this radiation is felt. And as I in indicated before, it is the connection between 5G and the Internet of Things because these lower frequency bands have the uh, potential to maximize your exposure. Tom Wheeler says that the view of the industry that anything, everything that can be connected will be connected. In other words, we will supply you will, with products that irradiate you and you will be paying for this. And so the plan is to have as many connections as possible. Their view is that every grain of sand in nature should converse with every other grain of sand because apparently this maximizes the market for the telecom industry. But this deployment of IoT will be ultimately limited not only by technical feasibility, but it has to be limited by hygiene, by privacy, and by environmental legislation. So as these frequencies become very busy over time, we will need to, uh, to I would say, control the phenomenon of their proliferation. So in summary, these three bands that uh, we know of because they are very close to the bands that we use at the moment for Wi-Fi for example we know what the impact of these uh, frequencies are we know that they are a problem for fertility we'll know they're a problem for cancer we know they're a problem for neurological diseases so why would we accept a I would say an enhancement uh, putting these systems on steroids when we have much more favorable and much more hygienic uh, uh, solutions to massive uh, telecommunications 
problems that we want to solve, of course. So in the end, uh, society is slow in recognizing significant health risks in the environment and in acting to remediate them. But the benefits to recognizing these risks is very substantial. Uh, electromagnetic radiation and wireless is indispensable in war. And from war, it has found its way into a number of systems, primarily in telecommunications, and its density in our environment has been increasing ever since. National regulations have protected the proliferation of waves to stimulate economic activity with only a passing investigation of chronic health impacts related to cancer, neurological diseases, reproductive problems, and diabetes, among others. Biological impacts have long been documented and health impacts are emergent from a combination of lab experiments, animal experiments, and epidemiology. As the International Agency for Research on, on Cancer is slated to review RF radiation in a couple of years, it will probably be declared a class one carcinogen. Is this what we want to see near our homes? So 5G introduces new frequencies, new casting methods, and an unprecedented precedented density of electromagnetic radiation in our environment. While high 5G frequencies may challenge the eye and more superficial tissues, its lower frequency bands may create a rich environment of radiating devices from which it will be very difficult to escape. Legislation on exposures, privacy, and power dissipation may be necessary to avoid substantial societal costs. Presently available alternatives such as optical fiber to the home and Li-Fi are presently available to improve on the worrisome perspectives offered by 5G. Thank you very much.